Welcome back to the panel discussion, Intelligent Threat Detection in Government, sponsored by Digital Reasoning on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. My guests today are Kerry Long, Program Manager at IARPA, Office of Director of National Intelligence, Deborah Pierre-Louis, Director of Policy Liaison and Training Oversight Office, Directorate of the Deputy CAO for Information Insurance and Chief Information Security Officer, U.S. Department of State, and Melinda Rogers, Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Justice, and finally, Tim Estes, Founder and CEO, Digital Reasoning. I am your moderator, John Gilroy. Ten days ago, I was hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains with my sister, and way up in the hills there, and we saw a, a lot of uh, fire-damaged trees and the brush got burned. In fact, the fire's going on right now, where, where I was at. And the trees survived it. And she said, you know, John, some of these trees are 200 years old, and they expect fires to come in every three or four years. And I'm trying to apply this to this discussion. So uh, is that encryption? Is that where encryption fits here? Is encryption the trees? <laughs> so we have an insider threat. If something's encrypted within the firewall, the 80-foot thick firewall, is, is that the answer? It, where's encryption fit in this whole picture of insider threat? I'll, I'll start with you, Melinda. It's one of the elements, certainly, but it's not the end-all, be-all. I think this is where, I, again, if we look at cybersecurity or security in general, there are so many elements to it. There are the, there's the machine element, which where encryption comes into play, where you have proper configuration and patching of your of your assets. And then when you look at the personnel security front, there's there's the continuous assessment to what degree is this person staying the course, or are they ex potentially exhibiting behaviors that um, is not what they typically exhibit, and that's something that encryption will not cure. So again, we just need to continuously look at the program holistically, what are all the elements at play? This may be normal today, but is the normal shifting to a different level tomorrow? So I think it's that awareness, the awareness of the constant change that we're dealing with. That's critical. So Craig, what good is encryption if the insider has the keys? <laughs> Exactly. I was going to say, almost by definition, the, threat, the reason we're so concerned about insider threats versus external threats is the insider has some special access that would be difficult for an external entity to get. Uh, so we're usually concerned about the information they already have the rights, the keys to have access to, you, uh, divulging that information, right? So encryption is, is a big, is a big uh, tool that we can use especially to protect data that he doesn't normally have access to or external entities don't have access to, but uh, it's not going to do much for, uh, for protecting the information that you expect him to have access to, right? Yeah. So, and you've got to make it easy for him to have access to it, so the, uh, the encryption's almost usually um, invisible to him anyway. So it's going to, if he can pop it up on, to see it, he can pop it up to share it, right? So, so Deborah. Is just a speed bump, this encryption, or what's your perspective? Oh, I, I echo both uh, Carrie and Melinda's thoughts on encryption. It's, 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 we have to have a defense in depth uh, strategy mm -hmm. towards everything in security and cybersecurity mm -hmm. as we approach things, especially like insider threat. Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter mm -hmm. how much we, uh, we look for it or, or it's, it's marketed to us, there just mm -hmm. is not that one tool. Mm -hmm. But I uh, do commend Tim and his um, efforts and research because that's what helps is uh, the gathering of that information, mm -hmm. the, the uh, curiosity of what's happening and what's going on in, on the network. And uh, I see we'll eventually start talking about CDM, I think that is the, the first um, uh, uh, line uh, where we'll start and as we start to collect that information and become more knowledgeable mm -hmm. of what is on the network, what is happening, how it's behaving, uh, then we can start uh, making those predictions and, and those decisions and modifying uh, how we react to insider threats. You know, Tim, I'm going to talk about the Santa Monica Mountains again. They expect fires every three or four years. Mm -hmm. So should everyone sit at this table expect to have insider threats and, and say, well, yeah, that's just a normal part of the course. Let's go to lunch and talk. Is, is, is that normal? Is I certainly hope we don't expect to get a snow every three or four years. <laughs> I mean, I don't think we can afford to do that. I don't think we can take $100 million of investment and flush it every three or four years mm -hmm. in terms of reboots. So I think that we do have to do more. Uh, I think everyone on this panel is committed as part of doing more. Um, so the, uh, the the thinking would be that um, you know the, I think it's been very well defined that you know insiders do have special access. Encryption may help prevent them going into adjacent domains without actually having to um, uh, circumvent the access, uh, use someone else, social engineer their way into that data. So that's where it's an interesting substrate of the security the in depth, uh, to use uh, Deborah's really good phrase. And, and I think that uh, this this sort of defense in depth. 
it, it does cry out for some level of ongoing profiling of employees you know, that have secure information access. And that profiling you know, kind of should come with a territory and it should be guarded well and it should probably be very intelligent so as not to create the false positives we brought up here in the discussion previously. Um, but I, it, it seems like a necessary piece of infrastructure. And I think where digital reasoning uh, is, is you know, trying to get uh, more capabilities in the hands of, of leaders who are working this problem is if you think of it like the five senses, uh, there's been a lot of investment uh, in the defensive measures of perimeter encryption, um, you know, authentication, maybe biometric authentication, um, but th that's sort of like having good eyes, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. And then we're looking at logs and some ha and patterns, and, and maybe that's our touch. Mm -hmm. But if it's not looking at what people are saying and who they're saying it to over time, it's like choosing not to hear. So in some ways, we're just trying to add all the senses, and any kind of answer is going to be holistic. Um, and the odds, the thing I will come back to, the positive, and I, I agree with Deborah's, like, I think, appropriate, re, like, call it realism on the problem. But I do think that people just don't act this way because they wake up in the morning one day and just become, unless they really have a schizophrenic breakdown, like, there is always signs. And people that are in the counterintelligence community understand this. Like, did they just have uh, money hit their bank account? You know, I mean, there's all kinds of things that come up in this space that are signs. Uh, and I, I think that when you put those signs together, uh, you can figure out who the risk indicators are early. Uh, and I, I think that, that that quantifies where you should look. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we're we've got to, getting more and more data, so we have more access to different profiles and patterns that are worth uh, knowing. Uh, and, and I don't think we can afford to assume it's just going to happen, that it's inevitability. I don't think that we should assume terrorism inevitability. I don't think we should assume that insider threat, you know, leading to massive data breaches is an inevitability. Uh, if we have done that, then, you know, I think we're in for a very bumpy ride. If I can add to that, yeah. I don't think it's we assume that it's an, an ev inevitability. It's more of um, when it's going to happen, we're prepared to respond. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's more of, of how it's looked across the federal government. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 we know it's going to happen. There's going to be a fire. Do we have what it takes to respond? And then at the same time, uh, can we? Uh, what can we mitigate right now? Mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 it's taking a, a two-prong, well, a multi-prong approach mm -hmm. in trying to address uh, a single problem. And keep in mind, that's not our only problem or issue that we, we must address, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. Secretary, when it comes to patterns and profiles, um, it's one thing to do it in in your uh, data center down the hall. Moving to the cloud, is there an extra challenge there? Should it, does that you know m keep you up at night moving the cloud, or where does this cloud fit in? So the, the cloud's actually my kind of my area of uh, of research at IARPA actually, and, and kind of the security implications as a result of it. It's. Um, it's going to bring a lot of challenges, a lot of new ways of thinking. If you think about it, your, your analogy of your perimeter in many ways kind of disappears in the cloud. Um, yeah, you can, you can create things called virtual private networks in the cloud, and you can have uh, virtual firewalls and things like that. But at the end of the day, you're sharing the same physical infrastructure. You're, say, you're, sharing, you're sharing, that's the way the cloud works. So there really isn't, no matter how you look at it, there really aren't these boundaries anymore. Um, the cloud it actually makes it very interesting for doing insider threat sort of remediation. Our poor guys that have to do it out there, they're used to doing forensics. Um, so they're used to going to a box if you suspect something's going on, taking an image and doing all that. Well, the whole nature of the cloud is it's ephemeral. So. For, from an insider threat perspective, at least right now, it's a, it's a good time to be an insider threat in the cloud because they're really, the, the whole science of doing forensics in, in, on a cloud infrastructure is still very, very nascent. Mm -hmm. um, it, it dis, it, by definition, it disappears after eight hours to save money. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, if you say, hey, I, 10 days ago I suspected something happened and something was exfiltrated, try going back to a Google or Amazon saying, hey, can I have the, uh, the, the computing environment 10 days ago, right? Um, can I get access to that? They're gonna be like, what are you talking about, right? Yeah. So. so Melinda, cloud? Yeah, uh, gosh, where do I begin? I think, I think with, um, so a couple things. One is, I th we're talking about 
commercial cloud vendors taking our solutions and applications out to the cloud. There are on-premise cloud solutions. I think certainly from a, from a government agency standpoint, we need to take a hard look at when does it make sense for us to outsource that particular capability to a commercial cloud vendor versus potentially keeping it in-house. We could still use certain private on-premise cloud capabilities within the agency, but again, it's that balance of risk management. It's gonna come down to what is the risk of us putting this information out there in a shared tenant model, for example. And again, when it's out there in a shared tenant model, who has access to this information? And what level of authorization is this purse does this person have becomes that much more important. And that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface in terms of the monitoring. Then we get into what is normal behavior versus abnormal behavior. So I think there's a lot more development to come on that front. Now, Deborah, I can't see how the State Department can survive without the cloud, different time zones, geographical locations. I mean, this has got to be part of your matrix. Oh yes, it, it, it definitely is. And um, back to what Melinda was saying, determining what uh, data you decide to outsource is very important. You almost have to uh, decide: is this information I'm willing to lose? <laughs> and and mm -hmm. it, you know that mm -hmm. that that almost has to be the question you ask yourself as you decide to go to uh, to to cloud. You know, what's the risk? Because you are actually opening up the aperture of your insider threat you know, uh, when you go into the cloud and to echo what Carrie was saying, uh, now you, you, you don't have a capability set to go back and do that forensics because it's cleaned every time. So, yeah. You know, Tim, one of the advantages of the cloud is this uh, dynamic capability to expand, condense, and, and fire something up, and what he's called spinning up a server. You can do it virtually really easily in the cloud, and, and you need to do it now with this uh, uh, amount of data that's being provided by the Internet of Things, and uh, by smartphones and all kinds of sensors. So where does the whole idea of big data fit in with this threat? Is this more headaches, fewer headaches, or how does this all fit in? Well, I do want to. I want to pick up something because I do think sometimes you know a lot of people have gone in making cloud a panacea, and I think there's a lot of wisdom coming from uh, our, all of our panelists today about this and the implications when you look at security as well. Uh, because there are things we just haven't figured out yet. The forensics one's a great point, and then the implications for people that have to buy at an enterprise level are substantial. Um, and so uh, to, to basically align best practices in government with best practices in industry, um, you know, with our banks, there's almost none of them that run our technology in a public cloud. The ones that have data at real scale, they have their communication systems sitting on their own kind of private cloudish things, their own Hadoop clusters. And I think the idea that it will all be a utility is just not right. I mean, there's a lot of value in it and for certain applications, but I do think it may have been oversold being just pragmatic about this. Uh, and I think there's going to be a hybrid model that continues. Uh, going to, uh, to really to Deborah's point, I do think there's kinds of data that aren't going to be uh, ready for the cloud nearly as fast as people think. Um, and part of it's because of the requirements on the data. Now, having said that, when you talk about big data and, and analytics, we actually aren't making sense of a lot of the smaller data we have yet. So I, I kind of think that there's a lot of hype also around big data. But in truth, if you can get a faster answer on the data that matters to you, that's where the rubber meets the road. So in most of the departments, uh, you're really talking about tens to hundreds of millions of emails a year maybe a billion, but you're probably in that range. That's not as much data as it sounds. It really isn't. All of Wikipedia, for instance, uh, is about 10 to 12 gigabytes of textual data. When you hear petabytes and exabytes, that's not human communication, it's not. It's a bunch of logs from devices, it's a bunch of replicated data. So if we made sense of the human data, we can do a lot of that where it's available cheaply on premise if we're honest about it. And then if we want to yield, go after the, the internet's data, then we can probably figure out a way to surge into the cloud and do that compute, and maybe even do it across multiple agencies so every agency isn't paying a different vendor for something that is a shared search function. So I, I kind of think in some ways, there's a lot of people pushing cloud, pushing newness, um, and, and I appreciate it when I hear you know, sort of the, the pragmatic view, which is it's a great tool, but you know, it's not a panacea. And you can leverage a lot of the, the value of, of moving data and uh, moving compute around on premise. 
uh, and with that, that environment. Uh, I do think we should copy patterns that large vendors have used because I think trying to reinvent a new architecture for that outside of people that really go into ambitious stuff like IARPA, it, it's a lot of expense. And I think a lot of times the contractors that promise it won't yield to the government what they promise, just to be very blunt. So I think if we don't need to reinvent the wheel, but if we can replicate on a smaller level where we have sensitive data, I think we're going to get the best of both worlds. Uh, and it's not a, I don't know if that's an obvious or typical industry view, but I think it's a pragmatic one. So, uh, Kerry, going back to words and meaning of words, so uh, not big data, better data. Is that the word? Is that a better word to apply in front of that data? So, it's, it's always a challenge to find what better da data is, right? Um, I think uh, we go to our digital reasoning uh, friends and uh, they, uh, a lot of times you don't know what you want to collect necessarily until the problem presents itself. Then you want that data, right? Mm -hmm. So, kind of what we find ourselves doing now I think the reason it is a big data problem, kind of going along with what you said, Tim, is people don't know what they need to collect right away. So the default action is to try to collect as much as possible and throw it away, but maybe it'll be there when we need it. Ideally, and we're, we have another, I'm, I'm pitching IARPA a little bit because I'm paid to do that. <laughs> um, we have another project that's, that's kind of going along with that that's saying maybe it doesn't have to be big data all the time. Maybe if the sensors were smarter, I, and a lot of times that'd be our workstations, mm -hmm. and they collected just when they needed to collect, uh, kind of a just-in-time thing, maybe we wouldn't have to store as much data and process as much. Maybe we could give some of our Hadoop clusters a break. Um, and that's a program called Virtue. But um, that's how the brain works, right? That's exactly how the, that's brain, how the brain works. It's called so existing, it, it, right? Yeah. 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 Right. And so it's, uh, it comes down to these silly people with two arms and two legs and doing analysis. That's mm -hmm. a scary word for some. I was scared of that word in high school. Yeah. No one wanted to take analysis. That was, but that's what boils down to many times, doesn't Very it? Very much so. Good, good, good. We're going to have to take a break and come back. We'll talk more about the insider threat. We're going to pause here for a short break. My guests today are Kerry Long, Program Manager at ARPA, Office of Director of National Intelligence. Deborah Pierre-Louis, Director of Policy, Liaison and Training Oversight Office, Directorate of the Deputy CIO, for Information Assurance and Chief Information Security Officer, U.S. Department of State, Melinda Rogers, Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Justice, and Tim Estes, Founder and CEO, Digital Reasoning. I'm your moderator, John Gilroy, on the discussion Intelligent Threat Detection in Government, sponsored by Digital Reasoning on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. 